I'm doing your great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop so I can come down to you? That is a great work from 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, as discussed in the Bible and the book of Nehemiah. Let's discuss how this continues to affect the region and the U.S. and national security today here on the Great Work Podcast. All right, welcome back, Great Word Podcast. Today is Monday, August 5th, 2024. I'm Amanda. I'm your host. And today, I'm sorry we're a little bit late, but I want to do actual U.S. politics today because it seems like tomorrow might be another big Middle East day, and I've barely talked about U.S. politics. And the whole reason I started doing these daily updates is to talk about U.S. politics. So I need to give you guys what you're asking for. Today, I want to tackle the question, not so much in headlines, but just the video I had that went viral a couple weeks ago was talking about, does, has Trump changed? Like, was he changed after the assassination attempt? Because over the weekend, we saw Trump at his rally in Atlanta, where he, you know, attacked Governor Brian Kemp and a lot of other well-liked establishment Republicans in Georgia. So that kind of seems like old Trump. Is it old Trump? Is he coming back? Did he ever leave? That's kind of what I want to talk about. And I didn't script this out because I want this to be... I don't know what I think, to be honest with you. Or I do, but I don't. So the original point I made in a video that I posted a couple weeks ago that went kind of viral about the status of the Republican Party is that Trump has changed. So people treat him like it's he's 2015 Trump and he's not 2015 Trump anymore. Again, we just witnessed some 2015 Trump behaviors. I maintain that I think he's changed in general. I think that there's two things to think about here. The first is that in 2015, we didn't know what he would be like as a president. And everything that they said he would be as a president, that he would put gays in concentration camps, that he would like make women into handmaidens, none of that happened. And so now when liberals talk about him as if we didn't already have four years of a Trump presidency, which had ups and downs, sure, but never put people in internment camps, which is what they were claiming, it seems like a weird argument to keep having. So I guess there's the, the content, like this part of the argument that, well, Trump didn't change but he was never going to be the guy that they said was going to put people in a term. Like, he never was what they said he was. And I'm seeing this even to this day. It's really bothering me talking to, like, people on the left lately. I guess we can talk about that later. So there's that component. Trump didn't change because he never was what they characterized him as. But Trump does have this like kind of thing about him where he is not afraid to go after the establishment. And to me, that's what we saw in Atlanta. Trump is attacking people again. And there's a lot of people who have different explanations for this. There are some people who are saying that Trump feels he is floundering in the polls and that's why he's attacking Republicans um, or establishment Republicans because he's worried he's going to lose and he doesn't want, he won't concede the election again. Interestingly, Mark Halperin, who does a daily YouTube show that I've started to watch, he talks to people in the inner circle of Trump's, like, Trump's inner circle. And Trump, I guess, has been saying to them privately, if he loses, he will accept the election results. Again, that's another reason I feel like Trump's kind of changed and that he's not going to do what he did after the 2020 election again, Um, which I think is fair. I think the 2020 election was like a weird one, right? Like so many mail-in ballots, all of those things. And I think it made sense to like contest that in some way. I don't know that it was right to say that it was stolen, but I understand contesting that election more versus, even though what he was saying I don't think would have ever worked, but to me I always saw the way that Trump was speaking about the 2020 election. He was doing that because some of the thing, like claims that were being made were so egregious that if he didn't speak out and say something's up here, they could it could just be swept under the rug, which it ultimately was, right? And by the way, we're kind of headed down a similar path now where they're doing the things he had a problem with were like ballot drop boxes because you can't figure out are people bringing the actual their ballots and the ballots of their loved ones or are they bringing other ballots that they got we don't know from where, right? And so I think that there's something to be set. Like, I think that that's more of the thing that he was taking issue with and I'm 
I'm like nervous to talk about this because I feel like there's no nuanced way to talk about this because people get so mad when you talk about this. But there was something to be said about like the 2020 election was like no other election. Way more people voted. We knew that there were things that were legal that were later ruled unconstitutional like voting measures in Pennsylvania which has obviously become like the number one swing state in the country and I think that Trump in a lot of ways went about it really poorly but I think that his thought process was like okay if I kind of go overboard people are going to talk about it and if people talk about it maybe if there were some sketchy things that again weren't illegal it wasn't stolen but if there were sketchy things we can talk about those things and resolve them. Um, and I do think that there's like something to be said too. I don't know necessarily where I come down on it because on one hand, it's not like Trump is the first person who contested or questioned the results of an election. Um, that was mainstream in the Democratic Party in 2000. Like when Al Gore lost, they they refused to say that he lost. So you see Abrams refused to ever concede the election in Georgia, in Georgia, <laughs> um, you know, what's his face? Um, and even in 2016, I mean, Hillary conceded, but then she went on a tirade saying that it was the Russians who hacked the election, impl like indicating that they somehow went in and changed vote to totals in the voting machines. But then, of course, when Trump does it, and again, he was like worse in some ways, like, but then, then that's too far. I think that as a society, we need to understand that, like, if both sides sometimes question election results because of certain practices, it can't be a political argument to fix that. But both sides make it political, and that's one of the things that's so annoying. Like you don't have a you don't have a true democracy if people don't respect or believe that elections actually are free and fair. And both sides in the last 20, 25 years have questioned it. So something needs to be done on that front, but neither side will really do anything about it. You know, I, uh, but then again, I mean, we went through the whole Mueller investigation, which was about the Russian dossier and like Russian collusion, which Trump was vindicated from. So I don't know. I mean, like we, we let them investigate that, but you know, whatever. So I don't know where we go from there. But anyways, if we get back to like, is is if Mark Halperin is correct, if Trump really does plan to concede the election, where are, and is he getting mad because he's been saying he would do that and now he's floundering in the polls? Also with the polls, I think it's, I think the polls are still really freaking weird. If you look at any of, I believe just in the last few days, Kamala has barely edged out. It's like a 505 to 49.5 margin of like Kamala will win versus Trump in betting odds. Um, maybe it's a little bit less than that in at polling aggregates. Trump is still ahead in some aggregates. He's behind in others. I believe a morning consult poll came out earlier today that has Kamala up four nationally. But the thing is, when you break down all of these polls by their cross tabs, all of them, Every single one of them, Kamala is doing worse with subgroups than any other recent Democrat nominee. So like she's doing worse than Hillary, Biden, and Obama with women. Now we're we're hearing that this election is going to be every woman's gonna vote for Kamala and every man's gonna vote for Trump and it's gonna be like a huge gender split. But based on the polling cro like the cross tabs of polls that have her up, that's not true. She's not doing as well with women. Then you have like her with Hispanics and blacks. She's getting less of a share of Hispanics and blacks than Biden did, than Obama did, than Hillary did. If you look at any of the cross tabs of any of these polls, and if you take those at face value based on exit polls and what um, former Democratic nominees were polling, it's going to be a Trump landslide, electorally speaking, and actually in the in the just popular vote. But then all of these polls show her winning right or she's up for and a lot of that is because they're over polling democrats and then they're not waiting it so i think i talked about that like last week or the week before where you know you might take more democrat responses because you want to figure out are democrats really coalescing behind the new nominee which it showed that they were again by like larger margins than biden or obama or um clinton yet 
like it's it's fascinating to me because then like right now I think I I don't remember if it was it wasn't morning consult or if it was I don't remember what it was but it was a D plus five poll unweighted meaning more Democrats by a margin of plus five are going to vote than Republicans which nobody thinks is going to happen it, every analyst is thinking that it's like at least even Democrats and Republicans will evenly vote. Now that doesn't get to like get out the vote efforts, but still both Republicans and Democrats feel adequately and evenly motivated to go vote. But in a D plus five poll, which is showing again that Democrats by a plus five margin are more likely to go vote. Kamala is up two. I don't, I don't think that was morning consult. I don't remember what poll that was, but that would be saying that again, she's getting less of a margin and then it also is kind of interesting because, again, like, if Kamala's barely winning in these polls and she's already got, like, 95% of the Democratic votes shares, she has to make up for it with independence. And she's down, like, five to eight points with independence across, again, like, swing state and general, general electorate polls. So I don't believe, like, I don't believe the polls. I'm not saying that she's going to lose right? Democrats have a much better get out the vote effort than Republicans do. Republicans have, and I believe Republicans are outsourcing it to Turning Point USA this year, which like I have zero faith in. So like if Democrats can just do well enough in the swing states of getting people out to vote, they, they totally have an edge. It's totally winnable for Kamala. This is a much tighter race than it was when it was Biden post-debate. But really, if you look at the polls, Kamala just brought it back to a pre-debate stage where Biden kind of flat. So I don't know. So is Trump acting like sketchy because he's starting to think he's going to lose? Maybe, but I don't even think that's it. I think that Trump is probably thinking he knows how to get the media talking about him and on his side. And Kamala's had two weeks of momentum and he wants the media to talk about him again. And so what does he do? He talks about like establishment Republicans because that gets anti-establishment Republicans really amped up and it gets his voting block of like blue collar men who wouldn't necessarily vote Republican or consider themselves Republicans 10 years ago that gets them amped up and this kind of like feeling and movement of like um anti-establishment Republicans or people who don't like that's Trump's base that's the people he needs to go out and vote for him um and on the flip side of that, then you have the establishment, in, at least in 2016 and in 2020, actually even more so, still lined up at the end of the day to vote for Trump. And are they going to do that this time? I don't know. Part of me feels like there he might lose a lot of the share of evangelicals. I'd like to see more polling on that, and I haven't seen very much. But when Trump took out, you know, abortion off the table... People act like that's going to do so well with him for moderates, but do these evangelicals just stay home now? I don't know. Because he needs their votes. Like, I don't care if the majority of people are, like, pro-choice. Like, that is a very big voting block for Republicans that we need to go turn out. So there's that, too. And then again, we also have, we're in a really tough spot geopolitically, and we have um, the economy floundering today. Apparently, it's Japan's fault. I need to watch more about that. I... Saw, my friend sent me a video saying that I need to see it's all Japan. I don't know. I don't know. And then we have like people like Frank Lund saying like, oh, the economy crash means nothing. It it has no effect. Inflation has a bigger effect. Well, I, the race between McCain and Obama was pretty tight until the economy crashed. And Bush being the Republican who was in charge, people just wanted a change then and they went for Obama. Now, is that because they were just voting against the party in charge and blaming them for the economy crashing? Or is that because people wanted more of a feeling of a social safety net and so they went towards a more liberal Democrat who would favor such a thing? They want to, like, you know, tax the rich because they're feeling it at home. I don't know. I don't think that we ever got... I don't know that you can come up with a definitive answer on that. But like if the economy is going to crash, I think that they're going to do a rate cut. So we're going to have a threat and like we're going to have a threat of a, an economy crashing and everyone's 401ks are down. I'm avoiding looking at mine. Is this going to have a big effect? I don't know. But if we get back to, again, has Trump changed? I think I still lean towards yes, he has. And he's just leaning on the tactics he has always used that he knows work for him, 
to get out Trump voters, like motivated Trump anti-establishment voters, either that identify as Republican or who don't, in order to try and get the news cycle kind of back talking about him. And I don't know if it'll work. And I don't, I mean, we're seeing now, I just saw like young Republicans for Harris just just debuted. There's all these like influencers now who are, and like, I don't like to say this because people said that I must be paid for supporting Israel and I'm not paid for that. Although I wish I was. Like these influencers who are like, you know, they go through, rattle off all the reasons that they are like hardcore should be in Trump's constituencies. Like only red meat, like our carnivore diet, like Bitcoin owners, like all this, and that they're voting for Kamala, not Trump, because Trump is so dangerous. And it's getting to the point where, like, they must be getting paid to say this. Like, there must be, there's no reason that that should be a thing, but that keeps being said, and it's just, like, a really weird position we're in with that. I don't know, and I just saw my friend Z.E. Silver, who I'm sure you all follow, make a video talking about um, how his whole For You feed right now is Democrats, because he's a Democrat, either being like, you must vote for Kamala because she's a woman or because she's black and like they, you know, they belong to those groups. Or it's people who are pro-Palestine who are like, I will not support Kamala because she's not good enough on Palestine. She's not going to betray Israel. And again, like that is not really reflected in polls. I don't think there's a ton of like single issue voters on Palestine. I really don't. And if there are they're all in Michigan and she's doing pretty well there so it doesn't really affect her. Progressives care a lot about that, you know? Like that's kind of like their issue du jour right now. And like if you look at polls, she's got 95% of Democrat respondents are enthusiastically supporting her. So I don't know. I don't know where we're at. Did Trump change is Kamala going to lose? These are just kind of my thoughts. I don't know. I don't know that I have a full answer. I don't know that I would have a full answer right now. We're in August. And I think another thing Mark Halpern keeps saying, which I think is probably the most important thing to think about, is that a lot of people don't pay attention to the election in August. A lot of people pay attention to the Olympics and then they just kind of focus on like getting back into school and everything and they don't really pay attention until after Labor Day. And so if that's the case, is all of this going around, is this even going to do anything? Another thing I see is like Trump isn't really doing like major um, appearances, which isn't true. He's been doing a bunch of rallies, but an he's really going hard on like the alternative media spots. So I think he just did some Jewish Twitch streamer that I've never heard of, but apparently is a very big deal, has like millions of followers. He, today, I think it was released that he's either with him or filmed an interview with him. He did something with Bryson DeChambeau, which is a massive golf YouTuber. He, I think that video came out like a week ago. So he's really doubling down. He does, obviously, J.D. Vance just did the Full Send podcast, which is like, has a primarily male audience and it's based on YouTube. He's doing a bunch of these like alternative media spots and we haven't really seen Kamala do that yet, right? We know why Biden wouldn't do it. And it's because he wasn't really doing, you know, media interviews where he wasn't, where he didn't have a script, basically. He wasn't doing long form interviews. Kamala can do those, but she hasn't been. And so, and there's a lot of alternative media that Kamala could do that I, again, like we haven't, like she could totally get on some of these big podcasts that are like more women focused like I I'm sure Kamala could do like call her daddy or um I'm sure she could do girls gotta eat or what is that I there's all these like women podcast I don't listen to any of them so you know there's that I mean Kamala it would be so smart for her to do like a true crime podcast or something because like she's kind of leaning into the prosecutor thing like, she should do a true crime podcast, but I we have not seen that from her. She seems to just, they're really, really messaging towards her, like, base. And, and like, all the polls saying are saying that people are just kind of, like, going behind her and, like, nobody really cares. I think Black Lives Matter is no longer really calling for an open convention or anything. I don't know. So it's just, it's a really interesting place we're in now. Still, Trump is doing better than any Republican nominee in the last 24 years, poll-wise, right now, even with Kamala sw being swapped in. I guess I'll end with, on the political polling side and stuff like that, like, 
you know, Biden was up seven at this time in the polling aggregates, like RCP average and stuff, um, as of like August 4th in 2020. And Trump, I believe, was up 1.2 points in that uh, as of yesterday, August 4th. So that race still came down to 30,000 votes across four states. So like this could be an, inc like this is going to be a big close race. And just people saying that it's like over for Trump or over for Kamala, I think are mistaken. Although again, like, these polls that are making it seem like, I just, I don't really believe the polls for Kamala right now. I really, they're very, they're very strange. Like the top lines, when you look at their cross tabs are just, they're very strange. And then people talking about her vice president too. The two that she's narrowed it down to at the time of me filming this at 3 Central on Monday, August 5th, are Walls, my governor, and Shapiro. I think Shapiro is actually a phenomenal politician. I think he'd be a great president. Kamala's not very well spoken when she goes off script. So to have him, I think he, he can make her look worse. Then there's also the component of he's Jewish. And while he has the exact same views on Israel-Palestine as every other Democrat, being that he's Jewish and it is a Jewish an or like an anti-Semitism problem in the left that they all don't want to talk about. And whenever it gets brought up, they say, well, it exists on the right too. Well, look inside. The call's coming inside of your house, guys. Be there's no reason he shouldn't be looked at seriously only because he but that that's their problem with him it's that he's jewish i think that that i think if she picks him that starts an actual civil war on the democratic part side where it's like like i don't think that they'll be able to like look away from that or just pretend it's not happening that people are saying that they won't support him because he's jewish and it just came out that he said over the weekend and when he was 20 he wrote that like palestinians are too battle-minded to have their own state first of all also really agree with him on that but like i i just don't see how this um i don't see how that like bodes well for the democrats on the flip side cop kamala prosecutor tough on crime which is kind of this what she's going with which is interesting having tim walls as her second well he looks less polished than her and he's not as well spoken as josh shapiro which will kind of make her look better but like the riots, the Minneapolis 2020 riots after George Floyd, I lived in the middle of them, okay? I literally lived in the middle of them. I had to leave my apartment for a week because it was so bad. And Walls basically just sat on his ass and didn't do anything. People, I, I think it's so fascinating because I'm seeing Democrats now be like, well, he was the congressman of a Republican district for so long. He, you know, he, he can like really be moderate and bridge the gap. First of all, any of his moderate positions, which he used to have some, he completely abandoned when he ran for governor. But also, Minnesotans know when he won the first congressional district and he kept winning, that's like an R plus 12 district. That should absolutely be a Republican district. And he kept winning it against a guy with name recognition, that wasn't because Walls is such a good candidate. That's because the, the Republican candidate was so bad. And I could tell hours of stories about how that used to go because it was so insane. Tim Walls didn't win that because he's an amazing politician or an amazing candidate. Again, it was the Republican Party of Minnesota's complete being a clusterfuck. That's the reason that Walls kept winning because the, the Republican Party basically doesn't exist here. Um, and, and even down there in a Republican stronghold, it, it barely exists. So it's, it'll be so interesting to me too, that he's being spun as like, oh, this moderate, like he can like really like he can win in Republican areas. He's, he's like a conservative Democrat. Again, are they going to lose the progressives? Is it going to help Democrats to have the face of the 2020 riots who bear, by the way, Kamala raised money for bail relief for the 2020 Minneapolis riots and got them out of jail. And then they had pretty high retrition rates and they went back out and started rioting again and then there was more chaos. So I, people say that nobody wants to talk about 2020 because it was bad for both parties, especially because like Trump and how he dealt with COVID. How the Democrats dealt with those riots, I think people are still mad about because crime is still really on people's mind and COVID really isn't. So... I think that that will be interesting too. 
I'll finish with kind of where we're at geopolitically right now, because like I said, there might be something big that pops off in Iran today. Trump said uh, with this streamer that he had heard that Iran might attack Israel tonight. Um, I saw earlier today that Iran had closed its airspace and that there were explosions being heard around Isfahan, which were like military readiness prepared exercises. I don't know. To me, I'm still kind of leaning towards Iran doesn't do anything. I think Israel has them in a really tough spot where like it was incredibly embarrassing what happened to them to be embarrassed in Tehran like that after the inauguration of their new president, which was another embarrassment that they that he died in a helicopter crash. Um, on the flip side, if Iran gives Israel a reason to fully attack, Israel knows where all their nuclear sites are, and they can fly a plane, they can fly an F-35 and take those out before Iran even knows that they're there, because Israel's proven that they can do that twice. So I don't, I kind of have a feeling that Iran doesn't want to give them that leverage. We saw a couple like barrages of missiles launched by Hezbollah over the weekend, but nothing insane. There was a drone infiltration last night, which was initially talked about that there was one casualty, but I believe that was blocked back and it was one critical injury. Switching from unguided missiles, the Falak ones, to drones, that is a de-escalation but on Hezbollah's part. Like, I'm, like it is. Um, the the Falak one is what hit Marshal Shams in the attack um, from two weeks ago on the Golan, <laughs> saying we're going to switch from launching unguided rock because if you know anything about a Falak one, they launch them off the back of trucks. So like, I I don't believe that they were aiming for Majdal Shams. They've they were aiming for a military base that's like six kilometers away or something, but they overshot and they've targeted that village like 20 or 30 times since October 8th but again like usually the Iron Dome intercepts and it's just the Iron Dome isn't 100% accurate but I like you could you can make the argument and I've heard people make the argument that like Hezbollah could just like they understand the red line was crossed and now they could just back off they're not going to stop attacking Israel right but if they use if they switch the way they attack again unguided missiles versus drones which are more precise or could be more precise that would be seen as like de-escalatory because you just you, you can't know where a falak one's gonna go you launch it i mean if you're parked on a pothole it's gonna completely change what which direction it's it's flown into and yes it's completely wrong that there's terror groups that just launch rockets and missiles at israel willy-nilly all the time like that's completely unacceptable but being that Israel's been focused in Gaza and has not really turned its eyes towards Hezbollah they've kind of opened things up to this like new these new rules of engagement um i think we've got a lot to think about with this uh, geopolitically again like if the economy crashes and we've got a major kinetic war breaking out there's us ships all over the Middle East right now. The Strait of Hormuz and the Red Sea in the Med, like everywhere. There's a ton, a ton of ships everywhere. And interestingly, all of the other groups, like countries that are telling their people to get out of Lebanon because that's where they feel, or I think France even told their citizens to get out of Iran, all of those urgings are much more intense than the U.S. urgings. They're, I think the U.S. upgraded to, from like a three to a four, and they had started telling Americans over the weekend to like get out, go anywhere they can, get any flight to anywhere, and that they would give them like loans to get out. But that even isn't as urgent as everybody else is saying. So I don't... I don't know what's going to happen with there. Again, Israel's got Iran in a tough place where like they kind of have to respond, but any response justifies Israel taking out their nuclear capabilities and stuff. Um, I think it's very obvious that Hezbollah does not want to drag Lebanon into a war. You can hear the way that um, Israelis and like the Israeli government and stuff have started talking about Lebanon. They're saying they're going to attack the entirety of Lebanon. They're not just going to attack Hezbollah. Again, to me, that's deterrent. That's to have a deterrent effect. I would argue that the reason that Hezbollah has not fully entered this war is because they know that Lebanon would not be supportive of it and that they would get into more trouble at home. I think they, they already know that they're on 
tough footing with like the um, response of Wally Jumplot, the um, Druze leader of Lebanon. He wouldn't call out Hezbollah by name, but like he, you know, he doesn't want to anger them. But I think Hezbollah knows that it, it needs to keep the other groups kind of at bay. So when Israel threatens all of Lebanon, that puts on domestic pressure at Hezbollah. Like, do not drag us into something that we don't want. We don't care if Israel completely decimates south of the Latani River. Just um, do not, don't you dare bring an Israeli response to Daya, which is like the Hezbollah stronghold of Beirut and stuff. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. If we're going to see a response, if we won't, apparently the U.S., the CENTCOM commander is in Israel right now meeting with them. Um, reports say that like Jordan, UAE, Bahrain, Saudi will all intercept missile, any missiles from Iran aimed at Israel along with like the United States, UK, France. I don't think anybody wants a regional war. And I think that both Israel and Iran are both talking like, oh, well, we might go to a regional war and it's just to like threaten each other. So who knows if it actually happens? Um, so we'll keep our eyes on that again. We might see something tonight. And again, it's 3.20 central time, which means at 10 o'clock is real time, 11 o'clock. So that would probably be coming in the next four hours or so. So maybe I'll go live on TikTok tonight if something pops off so you can tune into that. But for now, I'll end this here. Um, those are kind of my thoughts on like, has Trump changed? What's going on with the U.S. domestic election and the Democrat vice presidential situation, a little bit of geopolitical stuff. Um, I'll talk to y'all tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. An Excelsior Studios original production. A Hamilton County woman is facing serious charges accused of scamming several people out of rental homes. April 26, 2023 was a normal day for most in the suburbs of Indianapolis, but it was shaping up to be a very bad day for 25-year-old Megan Stoner who was notified of a warrant out for her arrest. Nine charges for corrupt business influence fraud where the loss is between $750 and $50,000 and theft. And unfortunately for Megan, she would not be navigating her newfound legal troubles in private because a community of hundreds who had been quietly watching her for years was assembling on the internet to discuss their experiences with her which ranged from bizarre to dangerous to outright criminal, arguably worse than what Megan had been charged with. Basically what she did was emotionally um, manipulated and I'll say abused even me for about nearly these 10 years. And like, she will suck you dry any inch you give her. She just takes them out. Like Google number after Google number, you block the one, She's not done yet. She's going to get that last mm -hmm. word. The second you let her in, she takes over. And I mean, I would wake up to 20, 30, 40 notifications. I mean, she was scrolling back through things from my high school. He's a dangerous human being. And the strangest thing of all is as her case unfolded, she continued to interact with this online community, which she called her haters which was made up of business owners she had scammed, politicos from throughout the country that she had solicited for donations, a network of evangelical pastors located outside of the United States, a local brigade of moms who had called out her antics in Facebook groups for years, and even a sex shaman ended up coming together to solve crimes that she had not yet been caught for, and were able to catch her after she ran from the police for a month and finally put her in jail. So how did this self-described political consultant, mental health advocate, teacher, and sexual assault survivor get into this mess in the first place? And how much of her story that she had told of herself on social media for years was actually true? That's what we'll explore here every Thursday on Don't Waste This Fucking Podcast, the story of Megan Stoner.